Bitcoin, the fifth event in the Medical Research and COVID-19 series. I'm Tanaz Rasuli with the Association of American Medical Colleges and Executive Director of the Ad Hoc Group for Medical Research. And we are very pleased to be co-hosting this event today with the Coalition for Health Funding. Before I begin, just a few housekeeping items. Because we are using Zoom's webinar format, all audience members are muted throughout the discussion, but we will be taking questions at the end. Uh, you can start submitting your questions now using the Q&A function. Just type your question, name, and organization. Today's briefing is not open to members of the press, so if you've joined us inadvertently, we are grateful for your interest, but would ask that you please disconnect at this time, and we are happy to follow up with you uh, afterwards. Um, as you all know, uh, much of what we now know and are continuing to learn about COVID-19 and its wide-ranging effects is the result of NIH-supported medical research all across the country. Our goal for this briefing series has been to give both advocates and congressional offices an opportunity to hear from the directors of NIH's individual institutes and centers, both about how research that they've supported uh, up until this point and ongoing work can help to continue informing our response to the pandemic, as well as the impact that COVID is having on existing research across the agency's broad portfolio. We have two moderators for today's briefing. Elizabeth Burroughs is Associate Vice President for Federal Relations at the Association of American Universities, and she is a member of the Ad Hoc Group for Medical Research Steering Committee. She will kick off the Q&A portion of the discussion. And to introduce our speaker for today, I will turn things over to Brittany Meyer, who is Senior Associate Director of Public Policy at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research and a member of the Coalition for Health Funding Board of Directors. Over to you, Brittany. Thank you so much, Taras. Um, so CHF and the Ad Hoc Group are pleased to welcome Dr. Nora Volkoff, Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse to our fifth event in this series. NIDA supports most of the world's research on, health, on the health aspects of drug use and addiction, and Dr. Volkoff's work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. As, re as a research psychologist and scientist, Dr. Volkoff pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the toxic and addictive properties of usable drugs. Her studies have documented changes in the dopamine system affecting, among others, the functions of the frontal brain regions involved with motivation and self-regulation in addiction. She has also made important contributions to the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, and aging, and to the imaging field. Dr. Volkoff was born in Mexico, attended the Modern American School, and earned her medical degree from the National University of Mexico in Mexico City, and her psychiatric residency was at New York University. Most of her professional career was spent at the Department of Energy's Brookhaven National Laboratory in Upton, New York, where she held many leadership uh, positions. Dr. Volkoff has also been the recipient of numerous awards and has been elected to membership at the Institute of Medicine in the National Academies of Science and into the Association of American Physicians. She has been named one of Time Magazine's top 100 people who shape our world one of 20 people to watch by, New Year's, by Newsweek magazine, Washingtonians magazine 100 most powerful women in 2015, 2017, and 2019, innovator of the year by US News and World Report, and one of the 34 who are changing healthcare by Fortune magazine. It's very impressive. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Volkoff to give an overview of NIDA's current activities, and then when she is done with her presentation, uh, Lisbeth will open it up to questions. So get your questions ready and feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Brittany, thanks very much. And first of all, uh, good morning to everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. And, um, and I wish we could get together soon in, in, in physical presence. I mean, I actually 
there's nothing like being able to interact with other human beings. And this actually um, just opens up the door to sort of say how, how devastating the pandemic has been for the opioid crisis because um, it basically has put uh, stress in all of the systems at the individual community and healthcare systems that are necessary to address it. The opioid crisis had not been under control when, when the pandemic hit us. And in, and in fact, in last year, on 2019, there was a significant increase in the number of people that died from opioids or by themselves or in combination with psychostimulant drugs. And that was actually over the past two decades that we have seen those numbers rise and rise and rise and more deaths. And it also, also has been challenging, not just in terms of the increases in deaths that we're seeing, but to the complexity of the, of the epidemic. It started with prescription opioids, it changes into heroin, and then we have the entry of synthetic opioids that makes things uh, much harder because these drugs are actually much more potent than, than heroin, much more potent than the regular opioids that people were taking before, and they are widely distributed. And so that accounts for why we have not been able to decrease, reduce the number of overdose deaths. And in 2019, there was a 4.6% increase in the country. And we were in this state when the pandemic hit us. And so what the pandemic did was uh, change a lot of systems, including access to certain drugs. And that uh, resulted in, the, actually in, in, in a very strange way, to uh, expansion of access to fentanyl, while we have seen reductions in access to prescription opioids and heroin, that's not the case for fentanyl, and we have also seen significant increases from reports of expansion of psychostimulant drugs, methamphetamine, and cocaine. And the data that we have uh, during the pandemic, which has also been a major challenge to get, uh, because in the past, even though the reports of when someone uh, overdoses, the autopsy report take several months to actually be conveyed, uh, this has been actually made much harder right now amidst all of the, the deaths that are happening and the overburdening of the healthcare system. So what, what does this mean for people that had an opioid use disorder? It means that normally the resources that they had and the strategies that our government had put as the main tools that we have to combat the epidemic, the opioid epidemic, which are, are expand the number of people that are given medication for opioid use disorder. If you give medications for opioid use disorder, you are going to reduce mortality dramatically. That's number one. Number two, retain them in treatment. As long as the person is taking their medication, their risk of death is reduced by 70%. And the third one is the distribution of naloxone. And again, one, I mean, the, the naloxone is, it's a medication that if you can provide when someone is just overdosing, you can save their lives. It's almost, almost magical. But the challenge is to give the medication rapidly and promptly. And of course, these three things have been jeopardized by the crisis. So in May, for example, when we have been closed down for several weeks, there was a dramatic reduction in people having access for medications for opioid use disorder. Many less than should have been, were being prescribed. And also that interfered with the distribution of naloxone. And it is very likely that these have been some of the reasons why we are seeing an increase in mortality from overdoses. Two, uh, when people overdose, they actually, in order to be reverted, someone has to observe that overdose. And with social distances, that has become much more, much harder. So yes, the overdose fatalities appear to be increasing, and this reflects um, changes in the, the structure of our society that has made it harder for them. And at the same time, the other side of the coin uh, that is emerging is people that have a substance use disorder are also at greater risk to get infected with COVID. And if they get infected with COVID, they actually are much more likely to have adverse outcomes. So it's bi-directionally negatively affecting one and the other. 
is increasing the likelihood of using drugs, the stress, the uncertainty, the lack of support, but also if you already have a problem with opioid use disorder or other substances use disorder, the pandemic makes you much more vulnerable to have adverse outcomes. And then the third component to all of these that we need to keep in our brains as a nation is that, um, that what is happening to all of us, uh, the changes in the economy, the loss of the jobs, the loss of loved ones, the social distancing, all of that is making each one of us more vulnerable to depression, to anxiety. Some people may actually way to cope for them is taking drugs. And we have seen, in fact, a significant increase in the consumption of drugs in our country. And we have seen also a significant increase in anxiety and depression. And uh, that reflects uh, the distress that this is happening on. So we need to understand too um, that the COVID pandemic is put, putting us as a nation to much more vulnerable to um, the risk of taking drugs and for those that were taking them to escalate their drug use and also for those that were in recovery to relapse. So these are the main three aspects that I wanted to bring with respect to the interaction of the pandemic with the substance use disorders and in particular the opioid crisis. But I also want to highlight that um, the another aspect that has been uh, very negatively affected by the pandemic is the research that we fund. And uh, that includes not just research that we're funding to address the opioid crisis, but research that is fundamental for the development of medications for actually implementing the science. All of that has been brought almost to a halt by a closing of um, the healthcare systems to research, by closing of justice settings to researchers, and by closing of the infrastructure that we rely on in order to be able to do this research, like uh, the IRBs that I ensure that proper protection is given to subjects. So the pandemic has impacted the populations that we're studying. The populations that we're studying are exacerbating the crisis. And then the research that is the structure that we use in order to develop tools to address it is also, has also been jeopardized. And with this, I want to end my, my talking points and open it up for any questions that you may have or for clarifications of anything that I have mentioned. Dr. Volko, thank you so much for that. We always really, really appreciate what you share with us, even though it, it's incredibly sobering. Um, not only the, the overdoses, but also the stresses coming out of COVID for future years. And I'm wondering if you could talk just a second about if NIH has changed its priorities looking forward to the next three to five years to try to adjust for the COVID situation, or if you're just waiting for the structures to come back online, the justice system and, and the health services. Well, I think that um, there's no way that what is happening to all of us is not going to be um, resetting all of our priorities. And the same is true in terms of the research that we are doing. And one of the areas that has emerged as clearly in need of special attention is that of um, health disparities. And it has been brought up to the light as clear as it's possible because more than half of the deaths are occurring in people that are either of African-American descent um, or that, uh, that are Hispanic. So those are the underrepresented groups. And this higher risk for mortality, as it is also higher risk for infection, um, is actually also observed among individuals have, that have a substance use disorder or an opioid use disorder, who already have very high risk of infection. So um, if they, on top of that, are uh, African-Americans, uh, they just basically, the risks are enormous. So understanding uh, and addressing uh, the causes of those disparities is a priority. Because without it, first of all, if you look at it from the perspective of the pandemic, you are not going to be able to contain the infections. 
And then when it comes to actually basically preventing mortality and over hospitalizations, you need to provide a high quality care for everyone. And the same thing pertains to what we are doing with the opioid crisis. And what is devastating is to see how, even though initially the opioid crisis has started in predominantly white Americans from rural areas, that has rapidly changed. And now the groups where we're seeing the highest increases in mortality, the rates, the increases in the rates on the increases are the highest are among African American and American Indians. And I think that when you look at data like that, sort of you, you are forced to see what is it that we need to do to change that, that situation. So this is one of the, the priorities. And for us, um, as an institute, where one of our main priorities is how do we prevent addiction? I mean, one of the main targets is to address children and adolescents because they are the most vulnerable. Uh, it's when your brain is developing and if you get exposed to stressful environments, that puts you at a disadvantage. So we have, throughout all of these years, promoted research to develop evidence-based interventions. And right now, in the circumstances that we are living, it becomes even so much more imperative that we understand better what are the consequences of those adverse environments into the human brain, into our behaviors, and into ultimately substance use disorders. So, we can personalize interventions that can help that individual. So that, again, is highlighted in one of our main, main uh, initiatives, the importance of building the science of prevention. So I would say those two are our top priorities. Well, well, well to that point of, of brain development and, and tracking adverse environments, could you please talk a little bit about how some of the NIDA longitudinal studies have been impacted or slowed by the COVID crisis and perhaps what resources NIDA and other institutes might need to try to catch up once, once the immediate COVID crisis is over? Yeah, no, it's, it's very unfortunate at multiple levels, including how it has jeopardized research and the longitudinal study, the largest ones that we have, is the ABCD study. And this is um, basically led by NIDA, but multiple institutes are involved with it. And it has been extraordinarily valuable to help us build the knowledge about how the human brain develops. And also importantly, how it is very negatively affected by uh, environments that do not provide the proper stimulation and support of those children. If you can clearly see and um, very objectively how it interferes with the development of the brain, delaying it in, in ways that uh, have consequences into your ability to um, perform activities. So that, that's one. So what has it happened? For example, in that one, the, it's a longitudinal study and the participants are imaged every two years. And this happened, the, the, basically the follow-up happened uh, when we had COVID, when COVID was basically led to the, the, the closure of the hospitals and, and the academic centers. So we have not been able to, um, we were only able to complete 50% of the sample in terms of obtaining those brain images. Um, that's just one example. We have, for example, another very, we've launched some very large, uh, clinical trials as part of addressing the opioid crisis. One of them is the healing community studies that identifies um, communities in four states that have the highest rates of mortality in the country to address, um, integrate evidence-based interventions to actually demonstrate that when this is integrated, you can reduce mortality by 40% in a period of uh, two years. Uh, those interventions have had to be put on hold and two, the uh, structure that was required in many instances to provide those interventions is undermined now because the resources are not necessarily there. So the cost to uh, the research, how it's affecting us or the researchers themselves is 
on the one hand, basically you have all of this infrastructure that is not able to perform. So you are going to basically, that means delay, that means expanding the, the amount of time that that research is going to need to be funded in order to complete its task. The second issue is that the structures that you had before that you were counting on in order to be able to help basically do the study and retain the participants may no longer be there. And that will require, uh, if you want to restart, investing to build them up. And, and then the, the third element that has, that has to do actually with retention, um, as the circumstances of the pandemic have made it so much harder for so many people, um, we are not able to retain participants the way that we had had in the past. So, so here you have it. I mean, it's, it's a major blunt, and we've tried to understand in terms of what, what's the amount of cost. And I would say that we probably uh, lost in, in sort of like in a one year, 35 to 40% of the resources. I mean, that we will need to invest that in order to get to the stage that we were, probably 40% of the resources. So it's, it's, and this is not just for us, I mean, this is all across the NIH. Well, thank you very much for that. And if I could just follow up on that, you know, as you know, I represent universities and many of our universities do not allow healthy clinical trial participants to come on their campuses anymore. And, you know, it's, it's just too much risk for them. And I know that many of our campuses are involved in the ABCD study and they're each weighing when, when can they let, you know, people come back on campus under what circumstances, under what protocols. So it's, it's certainly something that AAU and, and AAMC are, are very aware of and certainly want to help NIDA to the extent that we possibly can get back on get back on track. What would be some of the most helpful things the advocacy community can do to help, I don't know, advocate for the recapture of funding, the recapture of, of maybe young investigators who are falling out right now because their research is on hold and they need to find other jobs. What, what can the advocacy community do to, to help support these important initiatives? Yeah, and those are two extraordinary important points, and I'm going to jump in the latter one because I think that this gets to the top of my priority brain. I mean, science is what we have as a tool to address complex problems like, like the pandemic. Science is what's going to actually allow us to overcome it. I mean, it's our saving, I mean, saving us. Um, but science actually requires scientists, and scientists actually need to basically be continued training and given opportunity. So as a country, as we look forward on building into the future, we need to ensure that we have the scientists that will be there. And the pandemic has been particularly hard for young scientists because those that are in the transition of finishing, finishing their training and looking up, for example, for jobs are not given those opportunities because the university have lost resources. So they are not hiring. And I see that in my own laboratory, that people that were re uh, ready to go and start to become independent investigators are not given that opportunity. And this is a very sensitive stage in your career because it's when you actually are able to get the work that will get you your laboratory and, and, and moving in terms of, of knowledge. So this is crucial. And then so I say it's, it's number one, but, but I also, at the same time, understanding that this is really negatively impacting many universities. And as, as I think about it, and I was discussing the issue of the racial disparities, one of the aspects that, that we have been fighting at the NIH is to increase the diversity of the scientists. And it has been very, very challenging. And, and now the, you have these, added challenges to university. And what you can be certain is that the universities that are actually already, that were already at a disadvantage in terms of getting resources, where you may have many of those uh, students from underrepresented groups uh, being working, I mean, learning, being part of that school, those are the schools that are going to be affected the most. 
So you, with the fear is that the, the difficulties that our universities are facing are going to further enlarge the gaps because between the universities that have a lot of resources and those that do not. And those that do not have always been very important in certainly in trying to get us uh, ensure that we have scientists from underrepresented uh, groups being successful into getting into the scientific enterprise. So, yeah, but, but I do recognize that this is, of course, uh, harmful to all of the universities. I'm just making the point that those that were already at a disadvantage are going to be, at, it, they will have less resilience. Well, thank you for that. And, and we've got two more questions that have come in for, for the chat. Um, so the first question is um, from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And it says, more states have legalized medical cannabis use, but we are still uncertain of its medical benefit. Do we have more momentum to open up medical cannabis research at the federal level and are researchers prepared to conduct the research to inform us? I know that this is a, a big topic, a big concern for, for you personally. I remember you talking about it 15 years ago um, and, and would love to get your thoughts based on all of the state ballot results that came from the election a couple of weeks ago where we're seeing this movement in the states and the federal movement is not, is not keeping up with it. Yeah, no, and I, I'm smiling just because it's sort of like one of our, it's sort of like our repeating and repeating, repeating ourselves. I mean, we need to um, create a system um, at the federal level that facilitates research with cannabis because people are using it. It's not whether we like it or not like it, or we believe or not believe. We need the evidence and to determine whether it has some, um, properties that can be therapeutically beneficial. And if it does, there we have another tool to fight diseases, whatever those diseases or conditions may be. But if it's not, if it doesn't show benefit, we need to provide that objective evidence so that people may not forego another treatment for which there is evidence on the belief that marijuana is going to help them. Whichever, so whichever way the data goes, we owe it, it's our responsibility to ensure that, that we are doing the research that can inform people to what is, whether this could be beneficial or not. And so I would hope that we are, I, I'm someone that never gives up. So I, I it's that we've been going back and forth. So yes, this is one of the issues that we are there again, going to continue to try to, to work with, with the federal institutions that make these, these policies to make it easier to do research on cannabis. And as you're mentioning, more and more states are, have legalized uh, cannabis. And also now we have Oregon, which has decriminalized all of the drugs, and which basically I predict is going to lead to research, um, to try to do research with other substances. And so, so it is not, it's happening. People are basically making these decisions. It's, a lot of people is not one or two and, and and we cannot just not face that reality well thank you for that i, I really appreciate it and and finally our, our last question has to do with access to treatment and like many other practice areas addiction treatment has had to move to telehealth technologies or is trying to move to telehealth technologies could you please talk for a moment about how the field might be adapting to telehealth and what are and what are the some of the things that have been good and bad about trying to continue treatment and research using that platform? Yeah, no, telehealth has been able to buffer many of the challenges that we have, including what we're doing right now, which is having a dialogue that otherwise would not be possible. What has been good um, was that there have been policy changes that have facilitated that transition in the issue of the treatment of substance use disorder. So very important was the policy change from the DEA that allow a prescriber to initiate a patient with buprenorphine without having the patient to be physically present. And this has made it much easier to initiate patients on buprenorphine treatment. Also, the ease of the regulations in order to reimburse for telehealth had made it much more applicable and provide an opportunity, for example, 
to provide uh, follow-up of patients that can help them be retained in treatment in ways that are much easier. And also accessing individuals that otherwise, because say, for example, they, come, they are in a rural community or those in the justice setting would not have a help to a, a access to a provider. So all of that has been beneficial. And what we're trying to do as an agency is promote the investigators to actually evaluate the outcomes of such policy changes in terms of uh, expanding the access to medications, uh, whether they improve retention in treatment, uh, to understand also for whom these interventions may not be actually sufficient so that we can personalize and improve how we deliver them. So there is this uh, an opportunity for research and learning so we can optimize their utilization. We also have to recognize though that not everybody has access to uh, the web. So these very valuable tools also are restricted to some people that are very, very vulnerable. And I think that we as a nation, I would sort of say this should be a priority to ensure that everybody has access to the web um, because now it's a way that we communicate with one another. So it's become so indispensable. So it's no longer at all a luxury, it's necessary in many ways for survival. Um, for actually for mental health. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Volkan. Before I turn it over to Tanaz to, to wrap us up, are there any questions that we haven't asked you that we really should have asked you this morning? Yes, I would actually sort of say an area that we also have to basically um, realize is again, coming to children and adolescents because that's when your brain is forming how all of these changes in the way that we interact with one another ultimately are going to be influenced the patterns and the behaviors of these adolescents as they grow up to what extent not having the social face-to-face -face interactions jeopardize or basically in some instances may provide with other strengths and that is an opportunity that we have for understanding uh, the brain. And two, what are the consequences of getting COVID when uh, in a woman is pregnant to the newborn or to the child? I mean, we, we, we see them, they are asymptomatic, but there is also evidence that there may be long lasting effects. And so to me, this is another aspect that we have to keep our eyes on because if there are long-term effects in some children in terms of their development of the brain from the virus, as has been shown for other viral infections like the Spanish flu, then we need to be alert to it so that we can intervene to try to um, buffer some of those changes. That's the only other point that I would sort of say, it's keeping me awake at night. That notion that we really do not understand uh, how this virus may be influencing children and adolescents. Well, thank you very, very much, Dr. Volka. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tanaz to wrap up our meeting today. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Dr. Volka. You know, you, you talk about what's keeping you up at night, but every time I hear you speak, I, it makes me feel uh, sleep a little better at night knowing that you and your colleagues are working on all of these issues. So thank you for taking the time to, to join us today and for all the work that you do every day. Thanks for having me. And thank you to Lisbeth and to Brittany for moderating our briefing today and to all of you who were able to join us. Uh, our next event in this series will be December 4th with Dr. Ned Sharpless, who is director of the National Cancer Institute. And so hope you can all join us then. Thanks so much. Thanks very much. Bye-bye everyone.